Joining me today is Eddie Hartman, a partner and member of the board at Simon Kutcher, specializing in developing high growth revenue strategies and conducting effective go-to-market planning to achieve recurring revenue excellence. Eddie is a leading authority in the world of marketing. As well as being a licensed attorney, Eddie is the author of the best-selling book, Monetizing Innovation, How Smart Companies Design the Product Around the Price. Before becoming a partner, Eddie started and operated multiple companies with a total valuation in excess of $3 billion. On top of all of this, he is a frequent keynote speaker and lecturer at universities, including Stanford, Yale, and Harvard. Thank you so much for joining me today, Eddie. Thank you, Lauren. And I, I was lucky enough to contribute to the book, Monetizing Innovation, I wrote the preface, but the authors are actually Madhavan Ramanujam and Georg Kakin. But thank you for saying that. I, mean, I would love to say that I was the author of that amazing book. Um, I actually am working on the sequel with Madhavan. Incredible. What's the sequel about? Oh, I can't tell you. Oh, incredible. You know, you know uh, it's sort of like, think about it this way. Monetizing Innovation was all about thinking through how you can make sure that there is product, market, price fit, right, to your innovation, whatever it might be, not just market fit, right, product market fit, but product market price fit. Um, Sam Altman likes to say, build things people want. We think build thing, things people want to pay for. <laughs> yeah, really the difference between a company that succeeds and one that failed. And when you think about what do they want to pay for, you have those challenges of acquiring. And then once you've acquired a person, monetizing. And then once you've monetized them, what we're going to talk about today, which is retaining. How do you get the person to stay with you? Keep coming back. Um, if monetizing innovation was all about how do you create an amazing product, then our sequel is how do you create an amazing company, right? Okay. You've got to go from product to, you know, machine, factory, sales. So that's what that's what the uh, that's the second book is all about. Okay, I like the suspense. I like the mystery. I'm excited. I read Modernizing Innovation, so now I'm excited for the sequel. But we'll leave it at that so everyone's on their on the edge of their seats for when it releases. But for now, I'll go back to the conversation of retention. And we'll kick it off by asking for a little bit more about yourself and your experience. And we'll go from there. I had started, uh, well, one of the companies that I started was called LegalZoom. And LegalZoom, we were confident, was for a customer that would come in and get their will done or get their trademark registered or get their small business, their LLC maybe formed. And that was it. Once they were done with it, they could check that chore off and move on to other things. What we found was that actually that wasn't true. It was actually my introduction to Simon Kutcher. What we found was that uh, that wasn't true at all. If you're starting a business, you now have a lot of other things that you want help with. If you are registering a trademark, you want to know like, after the filing period, how do I make sure if, it, if it's going to be licensed, if it's uh, maybe somebody's infringing, what do I do then? And if you're, if you're, if you have a will, my goodness, you probably have a lot of things to think about as well. If you have children and they grow because children sometimes do that, then, you know, how should your will change if you move or if you acquire a property or if you sell property, uh, how should things change? So actually it turns out that what people wanted was a relationship. It's a funny thing. You know, I think sometimes we think, especially as entrepreneurs, that if we are asking a person to keep paying us money, that we're somehow taking advantage of them or maybe being pushy. In fact, it may be that that's exactly what this uh, customer wanted from you was an ongoing relationship, an ongoing commitment. But when that changed uh, at LegalZoom from let's sell something to let's create a relationship, wow, the, the, the world changed the language that we used, changed the metrics, changed it went from sales, right, or initial sales to to retention, to um, expansion, right, to like, you know, how, how do we keep people happy in a long term relationship with us? So interesting. It actually leads to my next question, because you are a mind reader here. But it's really interesting that you talk about retention in this way of building a relationship, not just transaction. So obviously, we know that leveraging the customer base is crucial for growing. And that's all fine and dandy. But what are some ways to actually do that? Or what are some ways to find that untapped potential within your existing customers? Because what we notice a lot of companies doing, which I think the narrative is changing a little bit these days, is it's all focused on acquisition. Like how do we get customers through the door? And then it's less focused on retention, which I think it's shifting about a bit nowadays. But from your perspective and your experience, what is the best ways or like what are some of the insights that people can leverage their existing customer base to actually grow and build those relationships? 
let's talk for a moment about why it's so important to do. You have to spend so much to acquire a customer these days. Um, the median acquisition cost, if you're acquiring a dollar, uh, you know, with the idea that it'll be somehow recurring or that you get a person, you know, coming to you more than once is about $1.75 right now, which has gone up quite a bit. And I'm talking primarily technology focused businesses, but you have to spend so much to acquire a customer. If they don't come back a few times, you're in trouble, right? You are, you're, you're unprofitable. Um, I had actually joked around with some colleagues. I said, you know, everything these days is retention. It's loyalty. It's creating a uh, recurring asset, except for, I'm guessing, you know, the coffin industry. Mm-hmm. And one of my partner colleagues said, ah, you know, that's not true. Actually, funeral homes oftentimes do the first funeral uh, on a discount in the hopes of getting to know the family and getting more business. So I guess even yeah, if you're putting <laughs> your very people retention, is still on the deal. But the thing is that much as with anything else that we do, um, you know, hiring somebody for a job, uh, you know, dating, anything, people have different expectations going in, uh, how they see it, how they see what they're going to get out of it, how what they think about in terms of uh, how long they want to be in something. Um, maybe I should, maybe I should leave dating out of that. But <laughs> people think very differently and thinking about the upfront, right? It, it turns out to actually be the most important thing. Now, let me actually turn that on its head. Imagine that you didn't think about the upfront. Imagine that you just did what a lot of people do and say, hey, um, I'm going to look at the people who are here, my current customers, and I'm just going to stand there by the exit. And as people are trying to leave, right? People are saying, oh, I want to cancel my subscription. I don't want to use you anymore. Um, I'm going to try to convince them to stay. Think about the person who's leaving. If you're providing an important function, they already have an alternative lined up. By the time that they leave here, they've already thought it through. They've already done the homework. They've gone out there and looked at alternatives. They've decided that you're not good. Mm-hmm. They've decided there's something better. At that point, you might be able to convince them to stay. Like you could do the, hey, baby, please don't go. You know, you know, companies do. But, but if you think about it in that context, it's almost, it's crazy. Like, why would you do it there? Probably a better thing to do would be to take a step back, look at your customer base and say, based on what I know, who seems likely to be thinking about leaving? Before they go out, before they find alternatives, before they price you against competitors, before they are really open to suggestions. And even better than that, even better would be acquiring people in the first place who are looking for a longer term commitment, right? So you can pretty much figure out, are, you know, am I buying fruit that's about to spoil? Or am I buying a long shelf life with my ad dollar, you know, or with my sales dollar, my marketing dollar, right? You can do, you can create lookalikes and go back and say, I want to acquire the people. So the best thing you can do, and by the way, it, it really is the one silver bullet. If you want retention to be much better, if you want, you know, NRR net retention to be much better, think about the people who are leaving and the people who are staying and acquire better. Acquire the sorts of people that are going to stay for a long time. Pay more for them because you'll get it back. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people, I know a lot of companies right now that they only look at conversion rate and average order value against their marketing dollar or whatever it might be. And I say that's like you want a, a, a box and you're only measuring two dimensions. Mm-hmm. You're not thinking about how long, right? How long will that person stay with you? Yeah. And by the way, again, it doesn't have to be strictly a subscription. Right. You know, Bill he, um, is a big investor in, yeah, he, he's an incredibly well-known uh, venture capitalist uh, investor. He, he likes to look at businesses that are reoccurring. So if you think about Uber, you don't have an Uber subscription. Right. They get a lot of money from repeat business. Why? Well, it's reoccurring. They, you know, people who use Uber like Uber, they want to keep using it. So it doesn't need to be um, a contractual subscription. But you should think about positioning people up front with the idea that it will be a longer term, you know, relationship and target the sorts of people based on a lookalike that are likely to do that. So the best place to start is actually before they come through your door. The second best place to, to be is before they started looking and, and already have an alternative. The worst place, and I think where people put, you know, 80% of their effort is when people already okay. have made up their mind. Yeah. yeah. And trying to convince them, like, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. You can do it. You can do it. You can change it around the margins. But if you really want to fundamentally shift your retention, uh, you're looking in the wrong place if you're standing there at the exit and saying, wait, 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 don't go. I like that a lot because it actually even touches on the fact that acquisition is more than just acquisition. 
like you're thinking about retention at the point of trying to get the customer because you're creating that lookalike. You're trying to understand what's going to keep them there for the long game versus, okay, once they're through the door, what do I do with them? And actually, it's very easy to understand based on your explanation of what kind of question should I be asking myself? Like, what should my business be looking like to go from that point of keeping them around for longer versus scrambling to get them back? And on that point, I want to touch a little bit on my base because I know it's a very innovative solution for customer management. So I wanted to know a little bit more about how you could explain what my base is and how it differs from your traditional customer management systems, because maybe it can also help with these kinds of questions and making sure that you actually accomplish all these things that you set out to do. My base began as uh, an attempt to boil down some math models. I was a, I was a, I went to Warden for my MBA and I was lucky enough to work for a guy named Pete Fader, who's a professor there, who's a genius, just a genius. Um, and uh, in conjunction with a professor from University College London, they came up with a way to model retention um, that fundamentally outperformed everything in the market. It's what Netflix uses. It's what yeah, it actually has been used in court cases against Netflix. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, we wanted to take math models like Pete's and some, uh, which is called a shifted beta geometric, by the way, for anyone who really likes nerding out on retention, <laughs> to say, hey, okay, can I take a cohort of people that I just brought in and predict how long they'll stay? You know, who will leave and when? The answer is, yeah, you can do that. We also wanted to bring in some uh, machine learning in order to say, we, we may not be able to figure out why, but who is going to leave, right? Um, and you can do that. And you can do the inverse of that as well. You can say who's unlikely to leave and likely to stay and potentially expand. So you can come up with those three fundamental models, right? A model for predicting your churn and retention, a model for saying who is risky, and a model for saying actually who is likely to expand, or some some people call that a velocity score. Yes. The idea at first was to boil that down, and we we developed this for some really big companies, companies you know. And then um, one of them I went back to, and I said, "So how's it going?" He said, "Well, we're not we're not really using it. You know, it was you know great, but we're not really using it." I said, "Why?" Yeah. And I said, "Well, I can't feel figure out how to put it in practice." And so what we did was we expanded my base, and we said, "All right, it can't just be math models. It has to actually." You know, it has to actually be real. It has to be effective in the field. And what we discovered was it's a combination of taking the model, which frankly, you, you may already have, if you use something like Gainsight, you may have some of this stuff already, and figuring out how to then put it in the toolkit of a salesperson, put it in the toolkit of a customer care, right? They, they can make it effective. And then thinking about compensation design to radically change from what we often see, which is sales bringing in a new customer, and not particularly caring about how long they stay because that's not how they're metric, right? Yeah. Uh, and instead, bringing compensation design to motivate the behavior that we want to see, having making sure that sales and customer success are really armed with these models and you know ready to use them. They understand who they need to talk to. They understand who's likely to stay, likely to leave, likely to be uh, you know be able to be expanded. And then, of course, making sure that the data and the math behind all this was solid. So that that in a nutshell is my base sort of three columns data, math, process, best practices, compensation to motivate people following best practices. So interesting. And what's, a, what's like an example of a company, obviously without names, but a company that's done really well with something like this? Have you seen like a radical shift happen? Something that's tied to a metric of some sort? Yeah, we like to see somewhere between a 10 and 15% improvement in NRR. Wow. Uh, net retention. Yeah. I, I, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's it, you know, if you follow, if you follow these sort of systematic things, um, you should be able to achieve that. Yeah. Interesting. I, everyone listening right now is searching on my breath as we speak. I can bet. <laughs> well, look, you know, I'm, I'm also, I, I love helping people in general. So if people just want to reach out, that's, that's fine as well. People don't need to like, you know, sit in my base, but I, I will say it's very powerful. That's awesome. And I guess um, just kind of bringing this all together. So we talked about of what you should be looking for when you're trying to figure out your retention and kind of fix the the leverage in the model there. We talked about some tools that you can have, some questions that you should be asking. I guess on the on the devil advocate side or the negative side a little bit, what are some of the challenges that you see come up when you focus on customer retention? How do you avoid those? The single biggest problem that we see is that people don't pay attention to it at all. Really? Um, I, yeah, really. Uh, here's what usually happens. Um, Everyone is focused, really, really, really focused on sales and winning in the market, right? And then you suddenly cross a point where you realize, hey, wait a second, more of my revenue is coming from 
my existing customers than it is from the new customers that I brought in. So you look at your you know, year's revenue and you suddenly realize, wait a second, things are shifting. But honestly, even at that point, Lauren, it's so like, it's, you know, it's fun yeah. and sexy to be in the market winning. So people focus on that as well. I know a uh, shiny company, object, I guess, in that sense, right? Yeah, very, very shiny. I know a company, uh, really, really well-regarded company, sales is, you know, sales and they get to ring the gong when they, when they win yeah. a new account <laughs> and they, um, you know, the CEO came up through the sales column, right? Their customer care group, which is the one re- responsible for any cross-selling, any retention, any upselling, they are called the order taking unit. Oh, wow. No one gets promoted out of the order taking unit. <laughs> yeah. right? It was like, like a fun department to deal with. Right. You know, who wants to work there? And yet, when you look at it, and it's much smaller, like much, much smaller than the sales team. But when you look at it right now, this company that I'm talking about, 88% of their revenue comes from their existing base, only 12% from the mighty sales organization, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Buffalo. <laughs> so uh, it, it's the first, the biggest problem that people make and the biggest problem people have is they don't put emphasis on retention. Right. They don't listen to your, to your uh, podcast, Lauren, I think. Yeah, they, they the, should be using the right podcast. They genuinely should. They genuinely yeah. should. The, the first problem is that they don't give it enough uh, attention. They don't really think about it. Um, the second thing is, I think, a lot of people think that as just, yeah, we'll try to save people or try to win them back. Yeah. It's so expensive to win people back, mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it, 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 I think everyone knows this, but retaining a customer and keeping them happy is so much less expensive, even if you have to put money and resources against it, than losing a customer and trying to convince them to, you know, come on back. Really, really, that's quite hard. So I'd say the single biggest problem, put more emphasis on it. Think about what you're calling your customer success or customer care, wherever it is that's talking to your customer base. As you grow, this will become 50%, 60%, 80%, 85%, a mature organization, probably 90% of your revenue is coming from your base, not from your newly acquired customers. But then the second thing is, if you think about that pyramid of acquisition into monetization, into retention, um, you're only looking at people when they're about to leave. Yeah. You've put your focus in the wrong place. Understand the customers who are likely to leave before they start shopping around and ideally acquire the people in the first place who are the most, most likely to want a longer term uh, commitment in the first place. Um, a trick you can do there, by the way, is if you're saying, well, that's too hard and I can't really aggregate or disaggregate my acquisition motion to be as effective as all that, one thing you can do is upfront reframe things and say, you know, what do people, well, what do people use, you know, DeSouza Industries for, uh, or DeSouza.ai, I guess, right now, right? <laughs> and, and instead of presenting use cases that are like single shot, orient their thinking, like actually, you know, most people get more out of DeSouza AI in their second year than their first year because of the following things. So the upfront material suggests a longer term relationship. Your prospects may think of it that way. They may think about it fundamentally differently. And you sort of, in some ways, can convert somebody who would have been a short term joiner into yeah. a longer term prospect. Interesting. I like the way you think about that, actually, because it kind of goes along with those very first nuggets of insight that you're giving us around just the way to think about it. I think a lot of this has to do with the way that you frame it in your own mind, because yes. just at the core fundamental, I think a lot of people think of this as acquisition on the left, retention on the right. They're separate. It's retention because it's just you. It's a have to do a need kind of thing. But just like you said, when they ignore it, that's where the issue comes in because then you end up having those mighty sales teams that's contributing 10% and the unit taking, you or the order taking units that are taking unit, yeah, that are right. operating 90% of the upsells and the revenue there. But even it makes me think about the structure of teams, how, like, where are you putting your resources, where you're investing the training and the learning and the development because your customer success or your retention focused people are the ones talking to the customers, continuously learning from them, always iterating from there. But I think it's the framing of how you put it that is really, really valuable and insight. We talk about that. There's a fun, I mean, not fun, tragic example from uh, England in the 1800s where you know, they were using Australia as a penal colony okay. for prisoners. And they were taking people from England who you know, committed crimes and bringing them to Botany Bay, which is, you know, in Australia, where they would offload. And ship's captains were paid for every uh, prisoner that they took on board, which makes sense, right? It's the right metric. Yeah. The death rate was shocking. And so Parliament, you know, they call sessions on this. What are they going to do about the terrible death rate? Because these prisoners, you know, they, they committed crime, but not, not to be executed. And the trip was turning into, it was like an 80% mortality rate, very, very high. What? Yeah, crazy. 
Uh, and so they said, okay, um, let's make sure that there's fresh food on the boat. And they did. And it didn't really change things much. And then they said, let's, okay, let's put fresh water on the boats. And they did. And it didn't change things much. And then someone said, let metric the sea captains for every person that is able to walk off the ship on their own accord, not just like can be carried off, but can walk off the ship in their own accord. That's the metric. Miraculously, mortality went down 90%. 90%? Now, people still died. Yeah, 90%. Mortality was still a factor. Like people die on these ships, especially if they're prisoners, they were, you know, not well treated. But figuring out the motivation is so important. If your sales team is only focused or your marketing UX team, if it's if you're predominantly self-serve, if they're only metric on, did you convert people? Did you bring them in? Did you make first sale? Did they make the first payment? And yeah, your retention isn't where you want it to be. Think about the Australian example. Yeah, think about maybe I pay them differently. Maybe I pay them over a period of time. Maybe I pay them based on how much work they even did with, you know, whatever customer success team or whatever team handles after action, right? But if you, again, if the single biggest problem is people don't make retention of focus, they sort of think like, well, they love me enough to come in the door, so they'll probably it's stay. It's good enough for that. Right, good enough, right. Um, if the single biggest problem is you're not putting enough focus on retention, you've got to go the full distance and motivate people to care as much as you do. Because sales isn't going to, unless again, you compensate them in the right way. Yeah. Also, one more thing. When people are thinking, hey, if they love me, they'll stay. It creates another suboptimal ocean, which is then people undercharge in order to bring people through the door. Yeah. How do I know people will love me and stay with me forever? I'll make the price so low that they don't even have to think about it, right? Retention is 99%. Why 99%? Your price is so low, no one even has to think about it, right? And, and what you've done is you fundamentally undervalued everything you're bringing to market, right? You're, you innovated, you sweat, you, you, you led a team. You defied the odds, you've launched a business, and you're charging price so low that your retention is 99%. You feel good about it until you suddenly realize you're not as profitable as you should be. You're not able to afford the R&D. <laughs> if, on the other hand, you you thought about, hey, listen, retention is something I need to take seriously, then that actually gives you the freedom to charge what you're worth. Yep. You have the sort of courage of your conviction, and you suddenly you're more profitable, you're able to afford better R&D, you're outperforming your competitors, you're hiring the right kind of talent, right? So yeah, there's, there's a lot to this. And, and a lot of it comes from that idea of not, not standing at the end of the chain when people are ready to leave. But think about it. Opening really, the door for them. <laughs> really, opening the door for them in a way like, hey, like, if you want to stay, like we, we have a, you know, we have, we have, you're looking for the right people and you're bringing those people in and you're setting them up with the expectation that they're going to be with you for a while. I like that a lot. So a couple action items. Number one, they have to listen to the podcast. Number two, they want to re-monetize the innovation and the sequel that's coming. And three, they really got to listen to this episode because there's so many insights and you just continue to drop these golden nuggets of information. So they'll go from standing at the exit to opening the door for their customers, which is what we need everybody to be doing, which I love. I love that. Instead of standing at the exit, open the door to the right ones. I love it. I think it's a perfect way to bring our episode to a close. But just before I let you go, we always do a couple lightning round questions just for fun. So I have a question for you, and then we always end on a piece of advice. Okay, so lightning round question number one. And you might have some piss about this one, so fine if that's true. But what is the best book about marketing or life in general that you'd recommend? Oh my goodness. I think if you haven't read, if you haven't read How Not to Be Wrong, oh no. uh, yeah, the, you, you should. It's a fantastic book. Yeah, I love it. If I can get a, a like a 1B, um, you read The Innovator's Dilemma. It's uh, it's fantastic. Okay. I've written those down too. So next time we chat, we can follow up when I've read those. Okay. Excellent. One is, who would you like to see a biopic about in the marketing world and which actor should play them? So, you know, way back in the late 1800s, um, fun fact, the first, so coupons, um, uh, a lot of people think, well, there's really been Always, there have always been coupons. Coupons are actually a relatively recent innovation. Okay. They started because, um, well, the fact is you may want to have a large buying population, but we're all different. Some people can afford things more than others. Some people have more, uh, put more value on something uh, than other people. Uh, if you can only charge one price, you're in trouble because you're either charging the high price and leaving out a lot of people, or you're charging the low price and you're not charging the full price for the, the people who can afford it. 
uh, in there, somebody realized, well, it was realized that the people who sort of have enough money, usually they're fully employed, right? Um, they don't have time to clip coupons. So they have, they have the money to buy things, but they don't have time to clip coupons. Meanwhile, people who aren't fully employed, and they might be retirees, they could be students, right? Um, they do have the time to clip coupons. And so you can segment your population into people who have the ability to pay, people who don't, with a simple introduction of a piece of paper that says, you know, 50 cents off or something. This has led to so much. This has led to why it costs more to get an airline ticket closer to the date. It has nothing to do with scarcity. It has everything to do with segmenting into the people who can afford it and the people, you know, because they're employed and the people who really, they could fly at any time. And so the, the first coupon was for Coca-Cola. Yeah. And a lot of people wonder, is it that Coca-Cola was famous and or became famous and drove coupons? Or was it instead that because of coupons, Coca-Cola was able to reach more people and became famous, right? Great question. But CW Post, who was a major guy in the cereal industry, saw what Coca-Cola was doing and introduced uh, coupons for cereal. And that that created a huge uh, change. When did yeah, you know I, I'd love to see a biopic. I think if I had to name a person, CW Post okay. and uh, birth of coupons, the birth of realizing that we're different from each other and that segments are a real thing. Okay, so if you're considering the next step in your journey, I think this should be it. But <laughs> just, just keep it as an idea. We never know. <laughs> okay, last but not least, just to end off our entire episode, is, is that is there a piece of marketing or life advice that somebody shared with you once that has always stayed with you? My dear friend and, and author, Madhavan, uh, said to me, um, price is an illusion. There's only value. Price is a way that we measure value. If you understand that, and if you understand that different people see the same thing, and see it differently in terms of the value that it will deliver, that is the fundament. That is a fundamental insight uh, as to what is pricing? How should it work? How should we interact with our customers? How should we interact with our market? I like that a lot because my favorite thing about this episode is that everything that you've said in the follow-up questions have tied back to a previous thing that you've mentioned. So whoever is listening to this right now, if you're as mind-blown as I am, you're just thinking of all these things because it actually ties in really well together. So that piece of advice is really helpful to kind of bring the whole the whole thing together. But with that, we will bring our episode to a close. Thank you so much for joining me today, Eddie. It was great to have you. And I'm literally looking forward to everyone's thoughts on this episode because I know they will have learned a lot. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Lauren. Great seeing you.